Thanks, Moar. Um, so thank you all for coming and joining us uh, for Elizabeth's talk. Um, if you wanna put your questions in the chat, I'll try to monitor it throughout and either find strategic points to ask Elizabeth or we can keep them for the end, uh, but also feel free to either raise your hand or just um, ask your questions as they come up. Um, all of those are fine options. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce, introduce Elizabeth Dupre. Elizabeth is a PhD candidate in the Integrated Program in Neuroscience, working with Dr. Jean-Baptiste Pauline. Her current research focuses on improving the inferences we can draw with high dimensional naturalistic data sets through tool and method development. She is also actively involved in community initiatives to promote open interdisciplinary science, and she currently serves as a chair for the Unifying Neuroscience and AI Quebec Unique Student Affairs Committee. So with that, um, please uh, join me in welcoming Elizabeth. Great. Thank you so much, Lonnie and, and Millar and everyone um, for coordinating this. I'm really delighted to be here and to tell you a little bit about some work we've been doing. So hopefully you can see my screen, um, please ping if not. And like Lonnie said, um, I'm happy to take questions throughout. I have the chat open on another monitor, but um, if you raise hands, please, you know, uh, either Lonnie, I'll, I'll let you decide how to deal with that. Um, but yeah, really happy to be here, really happy to tell you a little bit about some work we've been doing. Um, and the idea basically is this question of similarity across neural diversity. Um, and so what we did to address this is to think about an empirical evaluation of this method class known as functional alignment evaluated using intersubject decoding. So similarity across neural diversity, this sounds really uh, broad and I am borrowing the phrasing from an older cognitive neuroscience or cognitive science work. Um, but in fact, the problem is very concrete and something that we see in modern neuroimaging all the time. And the problem is this, if we wanna compare across two different subjects or you know, n numbers of subjects, how do we go about doing it? We need to find a way to create a mapping between their different activity patterns. And the most standard way to do this still in the field is to normalize to some standardized anatomical space. So uh, fittingly, for those of us in Montreal, this is usually the MNI space, the Montreal Neurological Institute space. Uh, and this works well, but we do know that there are still some limitations to this approach. So it doesn't fully address intersubject variability, um, and it doesn't address it along a, a range of issues. So we know, for example, that um, certain regions, so if you look at functionally defined regions, uh, using things like retinotopy, they may just be in, in slightly different sizes across different participants. We also know that there are differences in structure function mapping. That is what parts of the brain are really responsible for certain functions, in particular for some of uh, the higher order, quote unquote, association cortices, we see that there's relatively loose structure to function mapping. And this can be challenging then when you want to compare across participants to look at these higher cognitive functions. How do you create this mapping? So traditionally, what most of us do nowadays is to use Gaussian smoothing. Um, and this is useful for lots and lots of reasons, statistically, but it's also useful in that it smooths over some of the remaining intersubject variability that persists after anatomical alignment. Um, and so while this approach has proved very fruitful for the field, it's occasionally useful to step back and, and think about, you know, what are we really uh, trading off when we use this approach? And are there any alternatives that are worth considering? Um, so to do that, I just kind of want to frame the problem for us and, and really get us to this idea of how, why would we use functional alignment um, and explain what it is, because I think this is something that a lot of people, when they first start thinking about it, find very strange, because it's definitely a different way of thinking about the data. So if we have just the brain, and we have lots of measurements, um, so when we look at these measurements, we take a single one, and that's our voxel. And the way we traditionally think about this is we can look at that voxel's activity over time. And we can do this, you know, for another arbitrary voxel, let's say, we now have these two activity time courses. Kind of the field standard way at this point, perhaps, to relate the activity of these two voxels to one another is to look at the distance between their time courses, to take something like correlation, let's say. 
and say, okay, how similar are these two voxel time courses to one another on average? Another way to do it is to think about uh, rather than having this space defined as each voxel activity by time, you can look at their joint activity. So what I mean when I say that is let's say I have, actually, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, okay, we can. You, you can, great. All right, so let's say we have this little window, which is one measurement in the time series. And we're just gonna look at the two activity patterns there. And we can say that, okay, at this point in time, you know, voxel one has relatively high activity, voxel two has relatively low activity. And that's now kind of one of our observations in time. And so we can do that again for the next point in the time course. And we can do that again for the next point in the time course. And you can imagine doing this across the entire time course. And now you have uh, points in this space where the space is now defined by the number of voxels that you're looking at. So this may seem a little strange. Um, this is actually something that's uh, kind of an old technique. If you're fam familiar with, for example, dynamical systems analysis, this looks an awful lot like a phase plane drawing. Um, but you know, this is a really, really useful way to look at this kind of information of how do these relative activity patterns relate to one another. Um, I'm certainly not the first to suggest this. As I said, it's common across fields. And this is actually brought to fMRI in a really seminal paper by James Haxby's group in 2011. Um, and so this diagram looks an awful lot like the diagram I just showed you. But the difference here is that now we have three voxels. So we're in a three-dimensional space. And rather than just having dots in the time course, now I'm showing you different frames of a movie that were presented on screen for each measurement. So here it's the same basic idea, which is that we have our space, which is defined by the number of voxels we're looking at, and we have our points. And at each point, we know each voxel's uh, relative activity. So what's interesting now is you can say, all right, um, this sounds useful, but what can I do with it? So if I do this for another participant, you can see right away in this toy diagram, um, that there could be differences, right? You could have differences between the relative activity for each voxel across these participants to the same activation patterns. And so the question becomes, you know, this is useful information in and of itself to have these spaces where I can look at the activation patterns, but is there a way where I can actually um, bring this, this kind of information to learn about how to create this mapping? Our, our, core challenge, how to map across participants to find similarity. Um, and so what Hathi and others in the time sense have suggested is that yes, what this could be a really, really useful space to try and define transformations, which make our participants more similar to one another. So these transformations, um, again, because they're taking place in this voxel space rather than the anatomical or the world space, which many of us are more familiar with, are a bit difficult to wrap your head around at first, but the concept is exactly the same. We just wanna find a way to align uh, the participants now in this high dimensional voxel space. Um, and that then can create a transformation that we can use in all kinds of ways to find similarity um, in general across different neural recordings. Okay, so this sounds really, really exciting. And this is something that I've uh, spent a lot of time being excited about and thinking about. And for the work I want to tell you about today in particular, there were a few motivating questions that got us started. The first was, what set of transformations is really best to align functional spaces across our participants, across research subjects? You know, in the last diagram, we just said transformations in general. There are lots and lots of ways you can think about it in the same way that there are lots and lots of ways you can think about distance and, um, you know, how, how do you want to define these spaces? So to slightly constrain the problem, um, we're only going to consider distances or spaces defined by activation rather than alternative measures such as connectivity. The field has done a lot of really exciting work looking at some of these alternative measures. Um, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards or, or take questions on it, but that's not the work that I'm going to present today. 
There's another question that's really motivating here, which is, are there some contexts where alignment gives better performance? So are there some times where we can uh, define more meaningful or useful things for some downstream tasks? And this is a question we're actively exploring right now even more, but at least for this work, I'm going to frame it just as, is it uh, possible to get a very meaningful whole brain alignment? Or is like a, a task specific region of interest really what's going to give me a good alignment? And then the other thing I want to know is how do these alignment transformations qualitatively change the signal? So I mentioned that these transformations are something that's a bit hard to wrap your head around. Um, the famous Joff Hinton quote is, uh, you know, whenever you want to think in 14 dimensional space, just think in three dimensional space and say 14 very loudly. Um, Basically, like none of us can really think in these high dimensional spaces. So we just want to look, we want to see, you know, what is really happening to the signal in a way that we can actually grasp just looking qualitatively. All right, so those are the motivating questions for the work um, that led to our recent preprint. And I just want to first, before I even go into that, acknowledge the other uh, co-authors on this preprint, in particular, Thomas Basil, who's co-first author, um, and really a field expert in some of the methods that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. All right, so when we all sat down to do this paper, we had a couple of goals. The first goal is we wanted to quantitatively compare functional alignment methods at a whole brain scale. Um, we also wanted to quantitatively compare those same methods for task specific regions of interest. And then we wanted to qualitatively compare the transformations generated by each functional alignment method to really understand what they were doing to our signal. There's a lot of things to unpack here. The first is how are you going to quantify this alignment? Um, one way to think about it, which we found quite useful, is to think of alignment as a reconstruction problem. So if we frame it in a you know, predictive approach, you can imagine that we're holding out some subset of uh, brain maps, and we want to learn alignment with, part, uh, with some brain maps, then apply that alignment, um, and then see how well do we reconstruct our held out brain maps, our ground truth. Um, we could just directly compare the learnt and the held out maps, quantifying their differences through, for example, correlation. And this is something that's very commonly done within the field and makes a lot of sense. Um, for our case, however, we weren't as interested in these image-based statistics like correlation um, because we wanted to do really kind of a benchmark. We wanted to look across as many data sets as possible. And we know that some of these low-level uh, statistics or these image, uh, oh, excuse me. We know that some of these image-based statistics can be sensitive to low-level image characteristics such as smoothness, which means that if we're combining across many different data sets um, and each data set has a different base level of smoothness, for example, we may have data set differences in our benchmark that we're not as interested in. Um, so alternatively, another way to deal with this problem to say, you know, how good are our learned maps is to use a predictive framework such as intersubject decoding. And that's what we're going to do here. So for folks who are not familiar with intersubject decoding, I just wanted to give a, a quick graphic. Um, the basic idea is this. So let's say in this toy example, we have three conditions. We're going to train on a, a subset of our subjects, all but one, let's say, for leave one out. And we're going to train, in our case, throughout this paper, we're just training linear classifiers. So we're going to train a linear classifier, which is going to linearly draw lines in the space um, between our different condition types so that we can classify them as well as possible on this uh, subset of subject, all but one. Then we're going to test that learnt classifier on our held out subject, and we're going to assess how well they did. So in this case, it would be like a 33% accuracy because it's misclassifying body and tools, right? But this is the basic idea. And this is a really hard problem, actually. This is something that um, has motivated a lot of functional alignment work is that we find that, you know, if you want to take uh, classifiers across subjects, they often do quite, quite poorly. 
Um, and this implies that, you know, there's not this mapping between subjects that we would hope just looking at the anatomical data. Okay, so we're going to learn our functional alignment transformations. Um, and then we're going to uh, apply them and test how well they've done in this uh, predictive framework. Um, and so the next question is, how are we going to actually define our transformations? Um, so there are a couple different ways to do this. If you're looking at the whole brain, um, we usually don't want to learn a functional alignment transformation across the whole brain. Usually what we'd like to do is learn it within a local neighborhood. And this is important for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that it acts as a form of regularization. So it, it makes our transformations uh, a bit more, uh, well, first, biologically plausible, right? You wouldn't want to accidentally align the visual cortex in the front of the brain. That would be something that's not interesting, let's say. Um, and so if we want to learn within a local neighborhood, we need to aggregate our transformations in some way. We still want to be able to use them at the whole brain, even though we're defining them within these local neighborhoods. And so the question is how to do that. There are lots of ways you could imagine doing that. There are two that we've seen in the literature, which seem perhaps the most uh, compelling. The first is piecewise alignment. So here the basic idea is um, very similar to if you used parcellations before, this is exactly what it is. So you have some parcels that are predefined and they're non-overlapping. And the goal then is you learn a different transformation within each parcel and you just stack them into some larger transformation matrix. And the nice thing about this approach is that it retains all of the characteristics um, of the original transformations, right? So whatever properties they had before um, are also in the larger transformation. So here the, the sub ones are orthonormal and that's true in the larger as well. Elizabeth, I think that there's a question from Amir. Yes. Would you like to uh, say it, Amir? Sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So uh, I know Huxby's work, uh, maybe not yeah, the yeah. very, maybe not the newest uh, work, but I know the concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, it's difficult for me to understand uh, what do you mean here by learning and ground rules, etc. Huxby's mm -hmm. work uh, finds the mapping. Uh, you know, you, you can do it either with parcels or voxel by voxel by saying, okay, this voxel really likes this stimulus. And so in this subject, the voxel is in coordinate X, Y, Z. In the second subject, it is in X1, Y1, Z1, mm -hmm. or on the surface, etc. cetera. Uh, so what I miss here, and I wanted to ask it because I feel that I will kind of not understand the rest of it. No, no, please. Is, is how's the learning, where is the learning coming here? I mean, uh, from my point of view, I, you know, I left Huxby's work knowing that he finds the transformation. And then he aligns them all to the first subject. That's, mm -hmm. I, I asked him that and he tells me, you know, he told me I align it, all of them, to the very first subject. So where is the learning here? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So yes, so the, and this is something that I think is important for this work, which is that you, ca you are learning a transformation, right? So Haxby has proposed um, various iterations of using this method called Procrustes, which we'll get to, to learn these transformations and to apply them. The question though that we had is if you want to learn these transformations, that's great, but how do you know uh, which transformation is the most useful for you? Because uh, he's obviously developed various iterations and I think they're all very, um, very compelling, but other people have also developed various iterations and various methods, and they all rely upon slightly different criteria. And so if we want to give a recommendation for which functional alignment method we would suggest in a certain research context, we need to have a way to compare them. And so the best way to compare them that we found because of these issues around things like uh, um, image-based statistics 
for comparing across data sets was to adopt this predictive framework. So within the predictive framework, what we're, and at, I'll have a diagram a bit further on that shows this in more detail, but that's exactly what the learning is coming in. It's mapping, using the mappings from functional alignment to facilitate uh, intersubject decoding. And then we can use the decoding accuracy to say, um, okay, this method performs slightly better in this research context or not. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Great, okay. Um, yeah, and if there are any other questions, please please either put them in the chat or, or tell Lani. Lani, I will, I will rely on you and your judgment. No worries. <laughs> Great, okay. So let me just jump back. Um, we were talking about transformations. Yes, so, so now that we have this predictive framework, we want to be able to say at a whole brain context, you know, we're still gonna generate our transformations locally. We wanna be able to use them still in the whole brain. How do we do it? There are two ways. The first is this piecewise alignment, which as I mentioned, you learn the alignments in different non-overlapping parcels, and then you can just stack the transformations. And now what's nice is that they retain whatever properties you wanted uh, the parcel-based alignments to have. The alternate way, which has also been used in the literature, is what's called searchlight alignment. Um, if you're familiar with searchlight, that's what's happening here. You're basically just taking some, uh, some volume, like some sphere usually, and you're moving it through the brain. Um, and so the thing about these searchlights as composed to piecewise is that now you do have overlap. So here what's different on the left and the right side is that we have this green region, which is the overlap between the red and the blue in the searchlight and didn't exist in the non-overlapping piecewise. And what you can see that's uh, important to note is that now you're no longer guaranteed to have the same properties in the resulting alignment that you had um, when you uh, learned the individual pieces. Right, so here we can see now that if we're doing an aggregation by averaging, we're now no longer getting um, this, this orthogonal matrix. And so this uh, just means that searchlight is a different method than piecewise. It doesn't, it's not guaranteed to have the same properties that piecewise does, even though the learnt individual uh, searchlights might have the properties that were desired. The aggregate transform can now have slightly different properties. So it's worth considering separately. Okay, so with that, um, those two bits of information, the fact that we need to think about our aggregation scheme and the fact that we want to uh, use this intersubject decoding framework, we looked at the literature and we said, what are the methods that are commonly being used and so we identify five different methods. Um, I'm not gonna be have time, I think, to go through all the math and all of these. I'm happy to talk about it, but I just really wanna give you an intuition for each of the different methods, and we can come back to the details afterwards as folks are interested. The first method that we considered is piecewise procrustes. So this is the same piecewise using parcel, uh, non-overlapping parcels to define the alignment. Um, and we're doing this with Procrustes analysis. So this is the method that was really popularized um, by Haxby's group. It's a really lovely method. It's based off the idea of shape analysis. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're uh, trying to say, you know, if I consider my points in this voxel space um, as forming some kind of shape, how can I make these two shapes as similar as possible? Um, so you can do that both in a piecewise and in a searchlight manner. And both of these are very common throughout the literature. <clears throat> in fact, searchlight procrustes is what um, specifically was introduced originally as hyperalignment. Um, and so that's you know, a, a very well-regarded method. There's also another method, which is slightly different and which uh, our co-author Thomas Basile actually introduced to fMRI in 2019, which is optimal transport. Um, the idea behind this method is slightly different. So here what you're doing is you're basically saying, uh, I have two different, let's say, distributions, which are the two 
participants' voxel activity patterns. And I want to move one distribution to look like the other with the least amount of work. Um, so I want to find the optimal transport between the two. Um, how can I do that? And so this method uh, is, is really quite clever for doing that. One important uh, point here is that because um, it's naturally quite exhaustive, so the method as it was originally defined maps every possible combination of points, um, which means you know it's, it's difficult for basically all of us to run, even on Compute Canada. Um, and so, we introduced uh, a very common um, regularization, which is this uh, approximation to make the transformation more smooth so that it doesn't uh, have as much sensitivity to outline points. And so that was a user supplied hyperparameter um, that we did set for one value throughout our experiments. So that one has a hyperparameter. The next one, shared response modeling, also has a hyperparameter. Um, in that, it's very, very similar to Procrustes, but it does an initial dimensionality reduction. So this was introduced by Chen and colleagues. And the idea basically is that you have some uh, dimensionality that you preset, kind of like a PCA number of components that you want to take. And then after you do that initial dimensionality reduction, it's going to align using a method that's very similar to Procrustes. So you can consider it roughly equivalent, the difference being um, this dimensionality reduction. And here we use the same uh, value that Chen used in their original benchmark. Again, we're trying to just sort of give this idea of how well do the methods perform rather than optimizing for a particular research question. So we thought where possible, just go with whatever the original authors recommended. And then finally, we do this method that's a bit different, but I think quite interesting, um, and we call it intra-subject alignment. And I'll show a diagram to show how this is, is different in a second. Um, but here, what we're doing is we're learning the mapping between different conditions, and we do that using ridge regression. Um, and so we uh, do have a cross-validated uh, grid search to choose the best hyperparameter for the ridge regression, but that um, is done at a parcel level. All right, so let's, this is easier to think about with pictures. So let's just look at some pictures. Um, what are we really doing here? So for all the methods, except that last method, intersubject alignment, what we're doing is this. We take our alignment data, which, you know, let's say it's a movie. It's very slightly depending on the data set and we'll come into that, but let's pretend for this uh, discussion that it's a movie. So we have all our subjects watching a movie and we learn an alignment from our source subject to our target subject using this movie data. Then we can take some decoding tasks data that we want to use for intra-subject alignment and we apply that learnt alignment on the decoding task data to generate some predicted data. And we see how well does this predicted data um, perform with our intersubject inter decoding. What values do we get for the decoding accuracy? The alternative is this intersubject alignment, that last method I told you about, which uses ridge regression. Um, and here we're doing something slightly different. And what we're doing here is we're learning a mapping for each subject from the alignment data to our tasks decoding data. And this is really clever because the initial paper by Tabor and colleagues, what they were doing was learning a mapping from resting state to task. And so the idea is that if there's a consistent mapping in general um, between uh, resting state and task, and that what really differs is what people's initial resting state connectome value, activation values look like, then if you learn this, you can apply that learned mapping on your held out subject and still see how well does your task decoding perform? How well are you doing with your intersubject decoding on this predicted? So in both cases, it's this uh, held out decoding task data that's of interest is what we're predicting using the alignment, but how the alignment is generated and where it's applied are slightly different between the two variants, basically. Okay, so hopefully that helps to situate these methods a little bit better. Um, with that, we looked at, yeah, again, these five methods, 
And what we did for each method is to look at them both at the whole brain and the region of interest level of analysis. And at every point, we always compared them with standard anatomical only alignment. So if you just uh, did exactly the same pipeline I showed, but the only alignment you learned was what we normally have through anatomical normalization. So there's no functional alignment on top of it. I think we have a question from Anthony. Yeah. Anthony, sorry, should change my name on my Zoom thing. Um, <clears throat> I wanted uh, just a quick clarification, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so in your when you in your preamble for the methods, you talked about uh, uh, constructing a phase plane. Um, yes. Voxel time series, if I understood correctly, Absolutely. Is, is a, is a well-established method. Um, in the applications here, it looks like you're actually looking more at spatial uh, patterns of activations and, and their relationship um, as a, in, with, in, in relation to different uh, um, categories, for example, of stimuli. Um, so I'm, tr I'm trying to make the connection between the, the dynamics that you would cap capture in phase space versus the spatial mapping that you're looking at with the functional data and how, how those two are related. Absolutely. No, that's a really good question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, yes, so I think one thing that's sort of interesting here is that in the phase space, so again, this is the, the voxel defined space where you can look at the trajectories as they evolve over time. Really what we're doing is we're not analyzing the dynamics. We're using that trajectory to create a mapping to another trajectory of the same length in another subject's phase space. Um, so we're just mapping between the phase space trajectories. There's been other really interesting work trying to more directly look at the dynamics of that trajectory and to see, you know, uh, can we learn something about the stimulus class based on the dynamics of that trajectory. But for our first approximation, uh, just having a mapping between the different phase planes is really useful because then you can say, you know, is this a consistent trajectory that evolves in a common way across subjects or is it something a bit more idiosyncratic? Um, and that's not something I'm gonna talk about here, but some of the methods like shared response modeling in particular, allow you to disentangle this idea of what is the shared response, what is the common component across subjects and what is unique to each. And yeah. so that second part um, can be really, really useful to look at how these trajectories unfold. Maybe in, uh, idiosyncratic ways. in the discussion, so I've got some, like there's some other papers that have looked at um, um, the consistency of the phase space plane mapping, for example, in single unit recordings of monkeys, for instance, and looking at how that changes over time. Yes, uh, so yes. We can, we can park that until you're finished the rest of your talk and see how those relate. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I'd love to talk afterwards about how these things relate. I think uh, one thing that maybe we'll talk about in the discussion is I, I think there's a lot of really beautiful applications of this method all, or this class of methods already in both, you know, deep neural networks and systems neuroscience and, and lots and lots of fields. Um, so I'm, I'm focusing on its usage in fMRI, but I think that can help us with some of these other right. questions. Well, there, well. There's a direct translation, but we can, again, we'll talk about that after you let you continue, sorry. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Lonnie. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, so we're gonna look at these methods and we're gonna look at them at these different scales of both the whole brain and the ROI level of analysis. And we're gonna compare them to standard anatomically only, anatomical only alignment, because this is sort of the field baseline. We also compared it to smoothing, but we can talk about that after. Um, okay, so how do we do this? What's our procedure? The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate our intersubject decoding accuracy for each data set. And each data set has one or two tasks using standard anatomical only alignment. We're then gonna calculate our functional alignment transformations within the Schaefer 300 parcellation. Um, and we tested a bit whether or not the parcellation mattered. Um, I'm happy to show those results if folks are interested. We found that it really didn't with the exception of the intrasubject alignment method, which I told you was a bit unique. Um, and there it seemed to matter the resolution of the parcellation. So we took the highest resolution of Schaefer which is Schaefer 1000, but all, um, all the other ones that use parcellations use Schaefer 300. 
And then once we have this functional alignment transformation, we're going to apply it and recalculate our intersubject decoding accuracy so that we can directly compare between our functional alignment method and our standard anatomical only alignment. So here's just kind of a walkthrough of the overall pipeline. This first panel is stuff you've already seen before. This is just intersubject decoding. Um, so again, we're, we're learning it all on one and we're uh, uh, testing it on that held out subject just with anatomical only alignment. Now we're gonna go ahead and learn some functional alignment. So this is just like the diagram I showed you before um, or like the Haxby diagram. Here I've added little arrows between to make it slightly clearer that you can think of it as a shape that you just wanna move in space. Um, but that's really just for illustration. The basic point is the same. And then finally, we're going to take that applied functional alignment transformation uh, apply it to all the subjects, recalculate our intersubject decoding accuracy, and again, test it on that held out subject. So here you can see that now our linear classification boundary has moved slightly um, in terms of how we're dividing up these toy conditions. All right, so I told you we wanted to do this on uh, as many data sets as possible. Um, so we ended up identifying four data sets with five conditions. This was not uh, an easy thing to do, actually, um, because we really wanted data sets where we had alignment data and separate task decoding data. And we also were particularly interested in data sets where we got task decoding data that was above chance um, for within subject analysis. So we needed to have a decodable task and then separate alignment data, um, which took a bit of, of work to identify, but we were really lucky in that we've had um, some really wonderful data sets that have been shared. So the individual brain charting project, we learned alignments on 53 contrast maps because they have so many tasks collected that they just had, you know, now I think it's up to 140 contrast maps that you could learn alignments on and then have, still have a separate held out decoding task, two in this case, a language task and a sound task. We also use Bold 5000. Um, and so here we're decoding on the image or we're learning the alignment on the ImageNet, um, a subset of the ImageNet images. And then we're uh, testing it on these four categories, four images. Study Forest. We learned the alignment on the Forrest Gump audiovisual movie listening, and then we decode the music genre in a separate uh, music task. And then Courtois Neuromod, we learned the alignment using uh, movie watching for the documentary film Life. And then we took uh, the visual category for the HCP working memory task, which is these four body face place tools, and we decoded that. All right, so big reveal. How does it do? Um, so the first question is, you know, just looking at a whole brain level, what do we see? Um, and so here we see that piecewise optimal transport is really performing uh, the best of the surveyed methods, though piecewise procrustes is also performing quite well. Um, you can see that there is a decent amount of variability across the data sets in terms of these performance. And one thing I should note right away is that the reason you see so many dots for each data set is each dot is a separate cross-validation fold. Um, and so this corresponds to the number of subjects that were available in the data set because we do leave one out in general. Um, one thing that you see that surprises a bit um, is that the shared response model does so poorly in this context. Um, we think that's in part just because of the hyperparameter we chose. So we chose, again, the hyperparameter that corresponded to the original author's introduction of the shared response model, but they had introduced it in an ROI context and we're using it in a whole brain context. And so we think it's probably just the sensitivity of that hyperparameter. Um, but it's still important to note uh, that this is the difference. Ah, yes, and I see a question in the chat. Um, what is the baseline? That is a great question. And that is the anatomical only alignment. So here each uh, functional alignment method is compared to anatomical only alignment. And so one question that you might have is, uh, you know, how do I really scale this? What does this really mean to say, you know, I have an almost 5% increase in decoding accuracy 
over anatomical alignment when I do piecewise optimal transport. And so to do that, we um, looked at the within subject decoding accuracy for the different tasks. And we find that uh, this corresponds to about half of the accuracy lost to intersubject variability. So it's, uh, it's a significant improvement. It's not all of the accuracy you would expect if you had done within, on, within subject only, um, but it's about half of what you could imagine uh, seeing if you wanted to get to within subject, which is still quite impressive. Um, there's another question in the chat, which is what would be the accuracy of the baseline? Um, and so that depends on the particular decoding task. We have a table in supplemental, which I'm happy to grab, um, which lists for every method, for every data set, what the exact accuracy values are. Um, because these are on different scales, the different tasks have different accuracy, baseline accuracy values. They have different rates of chance and so on. Um, we found that was a bit confusing for the table, so we just compared it to anatomical only. But if you want the exact numbers, I can grab that for you as well. Um, ah, OK. And then there's a question is, what are the measures that make a task decodable or not when you selected the task? That's a great question. Um, this is something that uh, is not an easy answer, just because you know what you want when you look for a decodable task is something where there's clear differentiating signal between the different conditions. Um, and so you need something where you can tell apart. And, and again, here we're using linear classifiers. So it's possible that if you use nonlinear classifiers or you did something a bit more fancy, these tasks would be more decodable. Um, but we found that in order to do a really fair comparison and to avoid optimizing for each data set, we wanted to do something quite simple. So we needed something that had strong, sufficient signal to distinguish between conditions with a linear classifier was what made this decodable for us. Perfect. Okay. The other thing I want to show here, and this is something else that we were really interested in, is just what is the relative computation time? Um, because I don't know about you, but I think when I think about methods, it's really important to me that I can run them um, and that it's not something that, you know, I can only access in six months. Um, and so one thing we wanted to see was what's, how long does it really take to run these methods? And here we set the baseline um, to piecewise progresties, which is why it's uh, it's listed here, um, because this doesn't involve any hyperparameter selection. It doesn't involve the aggregation. Um, and you can see that uh, piecewise optimal transport, even though it's you know a slight increase, it has uh, 10 times the computational cost. So that is something to keep in mind, that this is much more computationally expensive. SRM is not even visible in this graph because it's so fast because of that initial dimensionality reduction. And search light hyperalignment does take quite a long time as well, um, or in the opposite direction. It takes quite a long time because you have to step so much smaller because you're aggregating over these overlapping neighborhoods. All right. So that was our first question. How does it perform at a whole brain level? The second question we wanted to ask is, how does it perform for task-specific regions of interest? So here, we defined our task-specific regions of interest very broadly. Um, so for Neuromod and Bold 5000, which are both visual tasks in this case, I'm using just the Yo7 visual network. For Steady Forest and IBC Sounds, I'm using this uh, bilateral auditory ROI, temporal auditory ROI. And for RSVP, which is specifically a language task, I'm using a left lateralized language ROI. And so here, this is the same uh, thing I just presented to you before. What really is kind of the main difference between this graph and the last graph is you can see that shared response modeling is doing much, much better. Um, and this, again, kind of aligns with the the reasoning that we had thought before that maybe it really is this hyperparameter selection of what is the dimensionality that becomes very, very important. Um, and here, when we have a smaller region, it seems to, to uh, be much more reasonable. We can also see that the computational cost uh, has shifted, um, which makes sense because now we're looking at smaller regions. And so now, actually, um, piecewise optimal transport is almost equivalent to progressives these values are much more uh, meaningful as well. Okay, so 
this sounds really good. Now we have kind of these quantitative measures of how well these methods are actually performing, how well do they compare to one another. But we also wanted to know what is the effect on the signal? What is it really changing for us? Um, so here what we're doing is we're doing a conjunction analysis for these uh, um, contrasts within these decoding tasks. So again, this is in the individual brain charting uh, data set. This is the sounds. Um, tasks. So here we can compare speech to silence or voice to silence. And here it's the language task. So we can compare sentences to words and words to consonants. And within this conjunction analysis, which just shows us where there's overlapping um, activation for this one, or we're going to do a conjunction analysis. This first one is just the individual subject. So this is our target subject that we're, you know, having everyone aligned to. And um, this is their activity pattern. Now we do a conjunction analysis with the other subjects after alignment or not in the case of anatomical, and we see what is the overlap or not. So really what we're doing here is we're comparing this target individual contrast to the group one. And what we can see is that um, there's still uh, signal specificity, good signal specificity across the different alignment methods. So we're not just seeing a lot of smoothing, which is always a concern. Um, that maybe this is just some kind of high dimensional smoothing. It doesn't appear to be that. Um, we do see differences between the different methods. So in general, it seems like piecewise optimal transport, for example, is better mapping the, um, the peaks of the distribution than some of the other methods. Um, and the shared response model, which uh, would align with its initial dimensionality reduction is a bit smoother um, than some of the other methods. But this is a really nice sense that indeed we are still retaining this signal specificity. Okay, so with that, I just wanna revisit what our goals were and, and what we found. First, we wanted to quantitatively compare functional alignment methods at a whole brain scale. Um, based on our results here, we suggest that optimal transport uh, performs best at this whole brain scale, and that piecewise procrustes also performs quite well at a significantly reduced computational cost, about a tenth of optimal transport. We also wanted to quantitatively compare functional alignment methods for individual task-specific regions of interest, and when we do this, we find the shared response model performs best, um, uh, which, is, which is exciting. And then we also wanted to qualitatively compare our transformations generated by each functional alignment method. And although we do see differences between the methods, which aligns with our expectations based on their differing response with intersubject decoding, we do see that just from a visual comparison, functional alignment methods in general retain signal specificity. So it's not um, just functioning as a kind of uh, anisotropic or high dimensional smoothing. Malar has a question, I believe. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, well, are you, are you want to, do you want to finish off? Maybe we can open the whole, the whole form to questions then. I think that would be a... Yeah, sure. Uh, I, what I just wanted to say then, sorry, was uh, thank you to my co-authors. So Thomas Bertrand and, and my supervisor, JB, as well as my lab, the Courtois Neuromod project uh, headed by Pierre Vallec, which uh, has been really invaluable for having their data available, as well as the individual brain charting project, my funders, and you all for your attention. And I just wanted to leave with some take home ideas and the code. Um, thanks so much, Liz. This is a really intriguing talk. Uh, this is definitely not uh, a field that I'm super familiar with. So um, if you could maybe go back uh, yeah. three slides where you show the alignments. Yes. So here where, where you're, you know, you're mentioning in some places where um, there's clearly, you know, better alignment and, uh, you know, in some, in some cases versus others. Can you maybe provide some intuition on you know, what is a better functional alignment and what isn't? Like, what would you be looking for, um, you know, in this particular case? And, and how can we interpret these maps a little bit more clearly? Absolutely. No, I think this is a really good question. Um, I will say that in general, I prefer not to use these maps to really rank kind of what is a better or a worse alignment. I think that for us, the intersubject decoding, the quantitative comparison provides a bit more um, grounding in a way that's that's easy to translate across data sets. But here we're just looking at individual brain charting. We're just looking at these two tasks. So it can provide some sort of intuition is the idea. Um, and really what 
I'm looking for when I see this is to see, you know, to what extent are the peaks of the, the individual, my target subject, their contrast, to what extent are they still represented? Or, you know, to what extent am I seeing sort of smooth activations? Um, because, you know, one, one way to, uh, one concern, let's say, that happens when you're thinking about these high dimensional functional spaces and no one knows what's happening really because no one can visualize it is that you're saying maybe what's happening is it's just a kind of smoothing. Maybe I'm just denoising the data through some sort of, you know, anisotropic smoothing and that's really what's happening. And so when I look at the maps, I should just see smoother maps and that would explain my performance. Um, so the fact that we don't see very, very smooth maps here, like if you look at um, optimal transport or Procrustes, these don't look super smooth. That I think is meaningful. Um, we do do a baseline more directly with Gaussian smoothing, but that's isotropic smoothing, but still um, this is not, it, it's just a good intuition that this is not merely smoothing that's masquerading as something else. I think we're opening up for questions. And Anthony, uh, do you have one? Yeah. Um, thanks again. Uh, great talk from us. Um, very interesting outcomes. And I'm looking forward to uh, navigating to your GitHub repository, see what's all going on. Um, I guess, uh, well, I, I, well, first of all, getting back to my original question on dynamics, I did, I did yeah. post a paper that was published from Gallego's group uh, in the chat window, it was published. Mm. In Open, open um, access so everybody can read it. And it's actually looking at um, aligning latent dynamics essentially of collections of neurons within the same monkey across time. Um, yes. Which is going to get to my, my two questions um, with these data. Um, first of all, um, <clears throat> is there a way to, to assess um, sort of a, a ground truth, like either through simulation where you actually have a data set where you you know, for example, the functional parcellation or functional distributions in two different subjects, and see if you can which technique works the best for that. And then second, um, extending from that, and this kind of gets back to the paper as well, is that how do these methods perform on the same person across multiple sessions, as well? Because you could envision that potentially, and I don't know, this is a question, that the functional distributions could also change across time within a person. Absolutely. Okay, so I, I'm going to take the second question first. Oh. This is something I am super interested in, and I have just not found the data set to do it yet. So there's a lot of really interesting literature in systems neuroscience around the idea of representational drift, which mm -hmm. is exactly this idea that you're talking about, which is, um, for those who are not familiar with it, I think it's really beautiful work. Um, Slightly, uh, definitely at a different scale, not necessarily, I'm not sure if this is something we can access or not with fMRI, but the idea is basically that we know that, uh, taking the example, for example, uh, let's say of a brain computer interface, yeah. if you have a brain computer interface that you implant and you use that interface to train a decoder, the performance of that decoder will steadily degrade over time, just continuously, um, even though we may uh, not be able to attribute that degradation to effects like gliosis or you know, scars from the implantation site. It seems that over time, neurons just sort of drift in how they're representing concepts. And yet we're able to maintain stable associations. Um, and so there's a lot of really beautiful work around representational drift, which is the idea of you know, how do we do that? Um, is it that you can then align these sorts of uh, so that's patterns. sort of the point of the paper that I posted is, is actually mm -hmm. how does this happen because they do they see exactly that thing in a motor learning task where the neurons that are responding for the motor task change their response properties across time but you can actually specify a latent dimension that encompasses that those neurons so that they still have the same function representation even though the instantiation again time, time point could be different so I think that's kind of what you're saying as well exactly exactly. Yeah, no, so that's, I, I'm super interested in that. I do not know the best data set to ask that with right now. Um, but if you have a data set in mind, I think it's, I think it's really beautiful, really beautiful stuff. If I'm not mistaken, in the HCP data set, they do have the same subjects measured more than once in the same task. Is that correct? They do, but I don't, I think it's not as extensive as I'd, I'd hope to see over time, kind of like a, I'd want 
I had imagined naively from looking at the representational drift literature that I'd want like 10 to 15 Or maybe the, the Midnight Scan Club. Which is all resting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it gets into the same question of how do you measure it? But no, 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 I think it's, I think something like that would be interesting. Okay. Um, There's a question uh, from Gabe uh, that yeah. I also wanted to add on to. Um, so he asks, has there been any consideration for how artifacts could influence the subject alignment? And kind of tying into that, I was curious about what you did for QC or pre-processing with uh, your data. No, absolutely. I think that's a great question. Uh, yes, there's lots of consideration. <laughs> for how artifacts can influence alignment. I think that's, you know, any sort of method like this, this is a very general question. Um, and so for this data set, I will say that, or for this uh, study, I will say for IBC, there's a, a SPM based pipeline that they use internally. And so we used their data um, that was generated through that. For the other data sets, we used fMRI prep um, to do our pre-processing um, and the QC was done just uh, by me for, for at least for the data sets that I processed. Um, some of them we were kind enough that the original authors helped us out and, and shared some of the work as well. Um, but yes, in terms of this question of how, uh, how artifacts could affect alignment, I think it's a really important one. I think uh, at least based on the studies that have been done so far, it does not seem to be driven by something like motion or anything like that. I mean, motion is always a concern, but that doesn't seem to be a distinguishing factor here. Um, and I think the other kind of interesting thing is that this method is, uh, again, we're talking about it in fMRI, but it's so general and it seems to work so broadly that, and it's well used across fields, um, that it doesn't seem as though that's really what's driving these effects. But I definitely agree that I think that that's something that, you know, with any kind of imaging data, you always have to be careful and you always have to, to look at that to check that it's true in this particular data set as well. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we were concerned about. Uh, I'm aware it is 12. Is, are there any other questions? If not, Elizabeth has also agreed to stay for a student discussion um, and if no one else raises their hand, I might abuse my position to ask one, one final question, <laughs> um, which is, oh, okay. Uh, which is, um, could, do you think that there'd be any uh, benefit to doing some sort of combination of like a traditional anatomical alignment in conjunction with uh, added information from the functional alignment? Uh, or do you think that there, like, does that not even make sense processing wise? No, absolutely. Yeah, so I think I think um, what we're doing here is we are using our anatomically aligned data to do functional alignment. We're doing kind of a, a very standard anatomical normalization. Um, you could imagine doing something slightly fancier, but the reason that it's useful is it gives you sort of an initial guess at a mapping. Um, and this is particularly true if you think that, you know, uh, maybe the structure function mapping is roughly correct. You're in roughly the right neighborhood of cortex or of the brain to be looking at, um, but there might still be some residual differences. That initial anatomical mapping can give you a good initialization um, for then looking to see, you know, how, can, how does intersubject variability play out? If you think there are much broader differences. So for example, variants of this method have been used to look across species, um, across humans and non-human primates. And I think in those cases, the initial anatomical normalization is less helpful um, because you just don't assume the correspondence exists in the same way. Um, and so there you wanna do something slightly different than what I've been talking about here. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that as well, but for, for this kind of method where you're really kind of looking in a neighborhood and just seeing, you know, what are the slight differences, the, the initial anatomical normalization is super helpful. Awesome, thanks. Um, well, thank you for the amazing talk and uh, coming on. Uh, thank you everyone for your questions and engagement. Uh, it's really great.